Hello aviation fans, Sky here, and today we will settle in the shadow of the great and powerful giants. When we think about giants, the first thing we imagine is of course the Queen. Boeing 747, the Jumbo Jet, a huge winged whale that has conquered the hearts of aviators and fleets of airlines. More than 1500 of these giants dominated the sky for decades. However, the story of this dominance is coming to an end. Demand for them is falling, production is declining, and it is likely to fall to zero just about now. Meanwhile overseas there is another giant. The Airbus A380 is an even bigger winged whale, one of the largest aircraft in history, an unrivaled machine. Airbus, having received such a trump card, captured the market, released over 200 airliners and announced that it would close the production by the beginning of the 2020s. Wait a minute. Boeing is wrapping up the 747. Okay, the plane is from the 1960s, it can't fly forever. But why retire the A380? It is barely over 10 years old. Does it mean that they are not leaving because of their age? But why then? Let's find out. Firstly, we will have to journey into the great and wild past. What do they got in there, King Kong? So, we're in the 1960s. The aviation industry is experiencing a real revolution. Let's get acquainted with a couple of nuances of this revolution. ETOPS Let's start with technology. The era of revolutionary engines had come. They were much more powerful and efficient than the old pistons, and could accelerate planes to unprecedented speeds. The problem of the new motors was their unreliability. The technology was pretty new, and they were failing often. The abbreviation ETOPS, Extended Range Twin Engine Operational Performance Standards, had become very relevant. It is a set of safety rules requiring twin engine planes to fly along the routes near accessible airfields, one hour of flight maximum. The probability of failure was pretty big, and it was believed that the second working engine would be enough to fly and land on the alternate airfield. Safety comes first, but because of this rule such airliners were forced to fly very winding routes, and the oceans were completely close to them. Technically, at that time, this was not a problem. Twin-engine airliners had no claim for the long-range routes. There was still not enough thrust for the required fuel reserve and range. If you want to fly far, use more engines. Three, or better yet, four. This is one of the reasons why the four-engine scheme at that time was mainstream for long-rangers. Hubs Now let's look at the transportation industry. With the advent of the jet era, aviators found themselves in a difficult situation. On the one hand, they got big and fast planes. On the other, the planes were very demanding. Many airfields simply could not receive them. Upgrade? There are hundreds of airports, and rebuilding them is incredibly difficult and expensive. Airlines found a solution. Instead of flying directly from all ports to all ports, flights began to be operated through hubs, to which small planes fly from all over the region. Passengers arrive there, transfer to large airliners and fly to their destination, or another hub and then to where they need to go. This spoke hub system is not always convenient to travelers, but it allows to reduce the number of routes, and the major upgrades are no longer needed in all airports, just in the main ones. The hubs seemed a great solution that gained popularity around the world. But they also had a problem. Being transport nodes, they were the bottlenecks of route networks. Not a critical problem in the beginning, with an increase in traffic led to terrible congestions. And not so much in the terminals, but rather on the airfields and runways. There was physically too many planes, and their number had to be somehow reduced while maintaining high passenger traffic. How to do it? Make planes fly faster, so they can carry out more flights. Or make them bigger, so that they can perform fewer flights, but carry more people on each of them. The implementation of the first idea was the supersonic transportation. The Concorde 2144 and Boeing 2707 were considered super promising. However, the harsh reality changed this opinion. The airplanes had serious flaws that could not be solved. The Concorde did not become popular. The 2144 flew just a bit, and the Boeing 2707 was never created at all. Since the first pass is a dead end, we need to take the second one. Air travelers were about to meet the wide fuselage. Boeing 747 In 1969, the sky saw the airliner that was destined to take the throne of the industry. The queen of the skies, the Boeing 747. A double-deck giant next to which any other plane seemed like a sprat. The Boeing 747 was a great solution of the congestion problem. 
The aircraft, capable of comfortably carrying three to four hundred passengers, unloaded airports, replacing several conventional planes at once. And its range of over 8,500 kilometers or 4,600 miles and four powerful engines removed the restrictions. On long-haul flights, it seemed completely uncontested. And this raised the popularity of the 747 to the heights no one could have imagined. Not without problems. The huge aircraft had huge infrastructural requirements. It was difficult to maintain and expensive to operate. High profitability was ensured by huge capacity. The plane was absolutely perfect for overloaded hubs, but for smaller airports it was not very suitable. Often they simply could not receive it, and the passenger traffic there was pretty small. There was a need for something close in coolness, but nevertheless more modest. Demand creates supply, and soon the family of wide-body Titans got replenished with trijets, Douglas DC-10 and Lockheed L-1011. Three-engined airliners were inferior to the Queen in size, capacity and range, but were much easier to operate, saving on maintenance and good fuel consumption. A slight simplification of the aircraft gave excellent results. But what if we go further? Two engines in 1972, the fresh-baked European Airbus took to the air with its firstborn, the A300. At first glance, the bird is controversial. Two engines gave insufficient thrust, which limited the mass of the aircraft, fuel reserve and range. Only about 5,000 kilometers, less than 3,000 miles. In addition, the ETOPS restrictions limited its performance. Compared to the first Trinity, the plane looks weak. But it ended up very successful. How? The secret of success was hiding behind the thoughts of failure. Although two engines limited the takeoff weight, they turned out to be much more economical than three, or especially four. The plane was smaller, lighter, and more tolerant to airports, having very good passenger capacity, nearly 300 people. Range and limitations? They couldn't use it on the main ocean routes, but the transcontinental routes, no problem. The plane fit perfectly into the networks of Europe, America, and Asia. The main problem of the A300 was the lack of engine thrust, and this problem was solved with technological development. Engines became more powerful, were lifting heavier aircraft with better capabilities. Plus, they were becoming more reliable and safe, which eased the restrictions. The alternate airports could now be not within an hour of flight, but within 90 minutes. This allowed airlines to choose routes more freely. The Americans could not ignore this phenomenon for long, and in 1981, they launched the Boeing 767, their own twin-engine wide-body airliner. Further better, while Boeing was developing the 767, Airbus launched the A310. In 1994, one of their most successful planes entered the arena, the model A330, an economical and efficient airliner that accommodates 400 people and flies almost 13,000 kilometers, over 7,000 miles. ETOPS expands the capabilities of these aircraft even more, 180 minutes, 3 whole hours. The first victims of this coup were the wide-body trijets. They are more difficult to maintain and consume more fuel, and their advantages were in fact negated. The Lockheed L-1011 is already history, the DC-10 was quite successful but outdated, and the MD-11 created to replace it in this new reality is uncompetitive. The era of three-engine giants is over. The Queen also feels serious pressure, but does not give up her winged throne. The 747-400 model, created in the late 1980s, solved many problems and remained a leader. In Europe, another four-engine giant, the A340, took over the flagship position. Yes, the twin-engine airliners were developing rapidly and were excellent, but they still could not afford such capacity. Until it appeared. Boeing 777 Progress cannot be stopped. Engines were getting more powerful, more reliable, and more economical. Finally, progress has spawned monsters such as the General Electric GE90, with fans over 3 meters in diameter and thrust. One such engine was more powerful than the entire power plant of the four-engine Boeing 707. Just a couple of these could carry a huge aircraft. And so it happened. The Boeing 777 retained the advantages of a twin-engine airliner, but at the same time, it was almost as huge as its big brothers. The very existence of the 777s called into question the need for such machines as the Boeing 747 and A340. Demand for them fell sharply, and while the still mighty 747 was able to hold its position, the A340's production was simply closed. 
Meanwhile, the new airliner was becoming more popular. By 2020, there's already more than 1600 of them around the world, and those planes cost over 300 million dollars each. So, let's look at the advantages of four-engine airliners, which were uncontested in the 1960s, from the point of view of the early 2000s. Number 1. Four engines are safer. Despite the popularity of this opinion, it is no longer relevant. Modern aircraft engines in a pair surpass the Alucrods both in power and reliability. The safety restrictions have almost disappeared. The limit of 60 minutes grew to 120, then to 180, and now it reaches 240 minutes, and this is not the limit. Airlines can build almost any routes. Number 2. Four engines give big thrust, which means big capacity, fuel reserve and range. I already said about the capacity, the 777 almost caught up with the Giants. With the range, in fact, now it is the other way around. The high consumption of quads requires carrying a huge amount of fuel, which makes the aircraft even heavier and increases the consumption even more. A vicious cycle. It is more profitable for the airlines to make the intermediate landing and refuel than to send an overloaded plane for a non-stop flight, even if technically it is quite possible. Two engines give comparable thrust, but they are much more economical and require less fuel. This is why nowadays only twin-engine airliners fly on the longest range routes. These two benefits can be discarded. What's next? Such big guys as the 777 were pressing very hard on capacity. There was a logical idea that, since twin-engine airliners are already almost as big as the flagships, we need to make the flagships even bigger. A380 this idea was picked up by the Europeans. They decided to make a plane so large that no one could compete with it in capacity. So, in 2005, the Airbus A380 was born. 575 tons, almost 80 meters in wingspan, four powerful engines, two full-fledged decks, the maximum capacity of 853 people. 853. If the Boeing 747 is the queen of the skies, then the A380, without too much modesty, can be considered the king. Such opportunities, of course, were expensive. At one time, the Boeing 747 became for the operators both a great trump card and a terrible headache. Despite all the efforts of engineers, the A380 did not avoid this problem. It is demanding on runways and takes up a lot of space on the airfield. It is difficult to maintain and moving hundreds of passengers between the gate and two decks is a real challenge. However, the task was completed. Airbus received an ultimate airliner with good demand. A number of the largest airlines immediately ordered a fairly decent amount of these very expensive planes. This trend was also not ignored by Boeing, of course, and the result of their work was the new generation of the Queen, the model 747-8. The plane was inferior to the European in size, but was still gigantic. Its capacity reached 470 seats in the usual layout, with a maximum of just over 600. It seemed that now a new balance is found. But alas, both corporations were mistaken with their flagships, because another trump card of such giants started to lose its weight. It is unthinkable, but the spoke hub transportation itself is not that undisputed anymore. Revolution The spoke hub system distributes the load between airports, giving local traffic to the regions and keeping long distance routes to themselves. In the 1960s, the problem of their overload was solved by wide-body airliners, but passenger traffic continued to grow and the problem emerged again. Hubs have turned into logistical nightmare, giant super expensive complexes with many terminals, tens of millions of passengers and traffic jams. Plus, travel using the hub system is not particularly convenient these days. You may often be surprised by a route with a transfer in a hub that is further than the final destination. Traveling from Prague to Barcelona through Frankfurt seems absurd, but in this system it is a common practice. At one time the hubs themselves were a necessary solution. Small airports built for piston aircraft were physically unable to work with jet airliners. And now? Now it is the 21st century, the infrastructure has adapted. An airport with the necessary equipment and good runway capable of working with jet aircraft is no longer such a unique thing. Yes, they cannot work with giants, but with machines a bit smaller, no problem. The world has changed, and sooner or later aviation had to change too. The embodiment of this radical change were the two brand new aircraft, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner and Airbus A350 XWB. At first glance this idea looks strange, because these planes are not that big. 
but the revolution is not in size. Boeing 747 and A380 are huge and roomy, but they are effective only in well-equipped airports with large passenger traffic. This makes the giants terribly inflexible. Not everywhere and not always are they good. The two newest airliners are smaller, the requirements for airports are much more modest, and the lower capacity simplifies filling. But make no mistake, they are not small. Both can easily take more than 300 people, and the use of the latest technology allows them to remain comfortable and efficient on a very wide range of routes, with different distances and passenger flow. Now, even fairly average airports can handle long-haul flights directly, and this factor reduces the need for hubs. Traffic begins to redistribute towards smaller airports where giants are inefficient. Therefore, the need for them is reduced. Given all the factors and changes in the industry described above, we have to admit, the giants are not leaving because they are old, they are simply no longer needed. Change in aviation is an evolutionary thing, so the Boeing 747 and A380 will be flying for many more years, but their production is ending and we are seeing the sunset of the era of four engine giants. Very soon, the A350-1000 will be the flagship Airbus model, and the next generation Boeing 777 will become the Queen's Air. Still a giant, but single deck and twin engine. And that's the journey through the industry today. Time passes, old legends give way to the new ones and we continue to watch. Like and subscribe to the channel. Fast flights and soft landings to you.